welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm a trained entrepreneurial leadership and business coach, a professional EOS implementer, and an established business owner myself. I am really passionate about helping business owners to have a better life through creating a better business. My guests have also experienced the highs and lows of business, and we want to share those learnings with you to help you avoid some of the common mistakes and also be inspired by their success. My hope is that you take something from each of these short episodes that you can put into action to help you get what you want, not only out of your business, but also your life. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am thrilled to have Susie McAlpine with us. Um, Susie has been introduced to me because she has written this book called Beyond Burnout, and she's going to share some of her tips and her tools from that. So welcome, Susie. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me on the show, Deborah. It's great to be here. My absolute pleasure. Hey, this is a really, really hot topic of mine, obviously working with entrepreneurs. We get a lot of people who experience various types of stress and issues. I'm not sure it was necessarily burnout, but I think it's going to be important to talk about what that means and what that looks like. So, um, yeah, I'd love you to start just by telling me a little bit about why did you write the book? Well, it was a perfect storm of three things, really. Uh, I had experienced burnout earlier in my career when I was in corporate, although ironically at the time I didn't recognise it as such. And my role uh, as a leadership coach working with senior leaders up and down the country, it gives me a front row seat to many burnt out, stressed out senior leaders, chief executives uh, and senior executives. And I started to see a growing number of people experiencing really high stress. And that was even before COVID. So I, I kind of got curious about that. And alongside that, at the same time, I started to see a real growth in research and articles coming up, up about burnout. But the third thing that really ignited my uh, desire to write to write this particular book is that What I noticed was that there were a plethora of books on burnout, but they were almost exclusively geared towards the person who who was experiencing burnout. And at first that kind of annoyed me a little bit. And the more I looked into that, the more I realized that that's a bit like treating the sick fish when it's the water that's contaminated. And I discovered that through research and reading that you really can't have a conversation about burnout without having a conversation around leadership practices, around culture of an organisation, around the systemic issues that cause burnout. Uh, And so I wanted to change that. Fantastic. How rude of me. I forgot to actually ask you before we got started. Tell us a little bit about what you actually do on a day-to-day basis. And if you can, also share a professional and a personal best with me. Okay. Uh, well, I'm a bit of a leadership geek. Uh, I, I love leadership. I love what magic emerges when great leadership is around and also the challenges uh, it, it, that come with being a leader. I've been a leader myself and uh, I work with leaders uh, in many, many different guises. Uh, I have a number of different, I suppose, products or, or, or service lines. One of them is I, uh, one-on-one coaching. I do a small amount of one-on-one coaching, mainly with chief executives. Uh, I have a uh, executive leadership team uh, performance, high-performance program where I work uh, with executive leadership teams over the course of about 12 months. It's called Pivot. Uh, and then finally, I have uh, the Leaders Map, which is an online blended leadership program for emerging leaders, which I work with corporates to help um, roll out. So personal best, other than hooking up with my husband 21 years ago, that was probably, <laughs> that was probably a good move. Uh, we've got three beautiful children. Uh, I would say writing this book has been a personal best for me. For a couple of reasons, I had wanted to write a book for many, many years. It was a goal of mine and a dream. And Mm -hmm. it's four years in the making when we looked at the research. And last year, I uh, wrote it alongside my uh, normal work. And there were a couple of things that I really learned from this. One is you don't have to do it alone. I was really fortunate to have an exceptional book writing coach, Wally Bock. He's in the States writes lots of, uh, helps uh, lots of people write books, so I thoroughly recommend him, and also Christina Wedgwood, who was my agent and editor, and um, of course I had Penguin Random House, so don't do it alone, and the other lesson I got from that was a little bit done often 
every day, yeah. uh, even if it feels like two steps forward uh, is one step back, is always the way to go. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I was talking to a friend the other day who actually wrote a book course on the same sort of thing. They said, just sit down and write every day. Um, and even if you don't get, you only get seven words and that's a start uh, rather than doing nothing. So, hey, so four years, so I understand that's quite a long time, but I understand why you did a huge amount of research, didn't you, behind this book and interviewed a whole bunch of people as well. So from that, how would you define burnout? Well, burnout is a state of emotional, physical and mental exhaustion and it's caused by excessive or prolonged stress, and it's related purely to your professional life. So you can have other forms of mental distress um, to do with your personal life, and that sucks, but that's not burnout. So there are there are three red flags of burnout. One is chronic exhaustion, and we're not talking about the sort of tiredness where if you go on holiday uh, or you have a weekend off, you bounce back. This is the no bounce back factor. It's when the batteries just won't recharge. And the second red flag is this increased cynicism or depersonalization. I talk about it with my no hug uh, moment with my son. It's it's a sort of a, a distancing, a detachment, and, a, and an increased frustration that perhaps isn't part of your normal uh, makeup, uh, a, a real cynicism and frustration. And the third red flag is really that reduced professional uh, efficacy. It's like I just can't do the job I'm supposed to be doing. Nothing I do matters. Uh, I interviewed one person for the book who had a great metaphor. They said it's a bit like trying to run a marathon in treacle. And so uh, those are sort of the things I think that are red flags. Uh, and I would say to, it's it's like you're exhausted, depleted and deflated. Yeah, that makes good sense. And so. What do you do when you've kind of reached that state? Because I should imagine it's quite a difficult thing to talk about. I know that as with a lot of the the mental illnesses uh, or mental um, symptoms, you know, talking about it feels like it's a personal, um, what do you call it, sort of a, 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 a negative, if you like. So how do how do you what do you do when you think you may have experienced or are experiencing burnout? Um, Deborah, one of the things I would say that I talk about four strategies in the book, uh, recognize, destigmatize, socialize, and organize. And you've pointed to one of the biggest challenges with burnout and any other uh, mental distress in our workplace, and that is it is shrouded in stigma. Uh, you know, Brene Brown says shame never drives any positive behavior. And I think we need to make it create psychological safety so that people feel that it is uh, okay and not career limiting to say I'm experiencing burnout uh, I am struggling and feeling overwhelmed and in the book I go into lots of strategies about doing that for yourself and others if you do find that you're the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and you might be going crikey that sounds a bit like me there are a couple of things I would say. One is don't uh, be compassionate. One of the big myths uh, that I've come across in burnout is that if you suffer from burnout, uh, you are somehow mentally weak or flawed or, you know, are a non-performer. And the research actually shows that quite often it's our most passionate and most dedicated and high performers who can actually be most at risk at burnout. Uh, so don't be kind to yourself, be compassionate, don't try and do it alone. I made that mistake where I just felt like I had to soldier on and dig deeper. Um, know that it will take some time, rest. There's some other uh, tips and tools in the book. But also I talk a little bit about if you're a leader who you think may be leading someone who's experiencing burnout, there are some strategies and approaches that you can take there. I was going to say, it's not just the leaders, is it? I mean, it can be, uh, as in the top leaders, it can be anybody in the organisation potentially. Um, so as a leader, it's your role to help them recognise that. Yeah. Absolutely. So burnout can happen to anyone. Anyone does and can, can suffer from burnout, regardless of where you are in the organisational hierarchy and indeed which industry uh, or profession that you're in. Although there are some... Uh, industries which feature and not in a good way, uh, the legal profession, the medical profession, uh, those who are in human services um, are also featured highly. Uh, but yes, I think it's, it, you know, leadership has a huge influence on both the prevention and cause of burnout. So I would I, I would say it's, it's important to not only put your own oxygen mask on, but also make sure that you're creating conditions where burnout can't take hold. 
Yeah. Now, in your book, you have, a, as you said, you've got the four strategies, but you've also got a number of tools. Um, where would be the best place to start for somebody who feels like they're potentially, you know, either approaching or actually at the stage of burnout? Mm-hmm. Do you have a favourite kind of tool that you would? Yeah, well, one of the causes of burnout is isolation, either perceived or real. So I would say that connection is a wonderful antidote to burnout, either to prevent it or if you're feeling it. I think mm-hmm. that in our organisations we have lots of what are we doing conversations and I think that's important, stuff needs to get done. But I think one of the things that you can do as a leader for yourself and others is to have how are we going conversations. So, you know, create psychological safety to cre- and be purposeful about creating connections. And this can be as simple as checking in with your staff and, you know, have your own peers around how, are, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how are you today? And oh, improve your listening skills, you know, asking how are you and then being fully present to yep. really listen and create that. So that would be one of my favourite tips, I think, is is make sure that you're having how are we going conversations as well as yeah. uh, what are we doing conversations. We often start meetings with, you know, one word about how you're feeling as well as sharing that professional and personal best, and it gives you a real insight into where people's emotional and head state is at because, yes, we often, I think I found particularly throughout the lockdown, a lot of Zoom meetings were just focused on, you know, what's going on. Um, and we had to sort of learn to start talking about how we're feeling. Mm. So a little bit of vulnerability and, required for that, it, isn't there? It has to be leader-led. Um, yeah. One of the most powerful ways you can build trust in your team, and that is an absolute must-do, you know, it's almost your first priority is to build tr- psychological safety and trust, is, yeah. to, is to demonstrate what we call that vulnerability-led uh, trust. So you go first as a leader. So you might say, look, you know, this is, I'm finding this challenging or uh, being open about your own challenges creates that space so that other people know that they can too. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Mm. And you, you, you know, in the book, you have interviewed a number of very, very high performing people. Could you share a couple of stories of people that you talked to who went through burnout and how, you know, what they did and how they um, dealt with it? How do they recognize it? What do they do with it? Well, we were really lucky that um, I worked with Kogo, who did one of the largest uh, workplace wellbeing surveys uh, in Australia and New Zealand, over 1,500 people. So we had some amazing research come out of that, which had to do with burnout. But one person I interviewed uh, for the book was a surgeon, and she was a very high-performing surgeon who had experienced really... uh, really strong and uh, debilitating burnout although at the time you know she soldiered on and it never uh, um, had an issue about um, causing patient safety or anything it was just pretty distressing for her what I think was wonderful about her was that because of her support and because she actually had a really supportive um, team around her and her boss uh, she was able to not leave. So I think the thing is, she now has recovered. Uh, she's probably stronger than ever. And so I think there's this myth that we, if, if you're suffering from burnout, you have to leave your profession or your job. And I don't think that is the case. And it was a, it was a wonderful story in the end because she had experienced burnout, but she come out the other side. And so yeah. you know, I'm hoping that's you know helpful. <laughs> So there is a way back from burnout and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to give everything up in order to deal with it. Totally. It's a bit like Rachel Hunter, it won't happen overnight, you know, that Pantene (laughs) ad, but it will happen. Uh, And hopefully in the book it's got some ideas about what you can do if you think you are experiencing burnout. But I guess my wish is, my hope is that we aren't the ambulance at the bottom of the the cliff, that we can create organisations where people as well as profits thrive. So what could us what you, you mentioned briefly at the beginning, but what sort of conditions in an organization can actually cause people to be so overwhelmed by stress? Yeah, this was really interesting, Deborah. When I looked into the research, there are six causes of burnout. The obvious one is overwork. That is, I haven't got enough resources to do the job, uh, working really long hours. But there are five others. One of them is insufficient reward. And this is really about a balance. You know, is what I'm putting in to this job and this work, am I getting enough back? And it's not only financial, it can be others. 
The third cause is isolation, and we talked about that. That's perceived sense of isolation. Really important, and this one's kind of a, a big one for those who are entrepreneurs who are or chief executives that could be isolating at the top. An absence of fairness, so things like distributive justice. Am I getting the same promotional perks or is there unfair treatment in the organisation can be a cause. Um, a values conflict or mismatch between values between your own personal values and that of the organisation. But the sixth one is a really big one. It's, called, it's a lack of control. And so one of the things that we really want to do is to Look at the degree to which people have a say in the way that their work is carried out. So if you can involve employees in the how and the what of their work, that's going to increase their locus of control. So I was quite surprised. So, you know, as an organisation and as a leader, those are the levers to work with uh, to reduce Mm. burnout. And it's interesting is the isolation thing. What happened in in the, the lockdown? Because there was physical isolation, but in actual fact, it's not just about physical isolation, is it? So um, did things change a wee bit in in terms of the way that we now view things, do you think, following the lockdown? Well, I think we can't be, uh, blame burnout, uh, COVID for all our burnout woes, but it certainly exacerbated a lot of these causes. Yes. I think... One silver lining has been uh, the importance of, as you were finding, it's important to have how we go in conversations and connect on how people are and their mental well-being. And I think that yeah. that really showed in um, COVID. I think we're still, most organisations are still finding their way uh, yeah. about that. But uh, I think certainly when you look overseas in certain professions like the healthcare uh, workers in America and the UK and parts of Europe, you can see that that burnout will be even more topical and more of an issue because of that isolation. And the scary thing about isolation is we're becoming more and more isolated at work than we ever have been before. Uh, and this once again talks to the importance of creating psychological trust and safety where people can show up and be themselves at work. I think that's really important. Um, and once again, it comes back to leader that the tone is set by the leader. Yeah. And so why do you think that is? Why are we becoming more and more isolated? What's going on there? Well, there's a lot of different causes, I think. Uh, We're more connected than we ever have been before, certainly with social media. Um, I look at my teenage daughter and, you know, they're, they're on Snapchat and, you know, TikTok. But I think we are having less and less meaningful uh, deep face-to-face relationship, you know, conversations, and I think that's important. I, I mean, the world is becoming more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, and so the pace of work is getting much higher. And so I think that certainly doesn't that doesn't help. Um, and, and so there's a myriad of reasons, but I think it becomes even more important to to really be purposeful about building connection uh, and creating safety. Fantastic. Okay. So we like to always give our listeners a few tips they can actually take away and put into action straight away because it's important. I mean, part of the reason for this podcast is is to have those authentic conversations, but then also give some tools to go away with it. So could you share with us three of your sort of top tips for people um, in a leadership role or potentially, you know, somebody just starting to feel like they might be getting towards burnout? I wrote a blog on my uh, blog, The Leader's Digest, just when COVID came and play here in New Zealand and I think it's a really good one Uh, it's called working and it's not mine Uh, it's Stephen Covey came up with this concept of working within your circle of control not your circle of influence so there's always going to be things that are beyond our circle of um, you know that are going to be in our circle of influence that are affecting us but are beyond our circle of control so wherever possible work what is within my control in this situation? And I talk about how to use that in the book. So I think that's a really good one. Because that overcomes that feeling of lack of control, doesn't it? Because if you're totally. trying to change things you can't change, you're going to have that whole yeah, experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. The second one is for leaders, uh, not only for themselves, but certainly when you're looking at what you're taking on in your organisation, is to get really clear at priority. Uh, you know, prioritising and priorities. I often work with senior leadership teams and sometimes, you know, I've heard the the comment, oh, we're working on these 10 priorities this year. 
And I challenge them, that's an oxymoron, you know, really look at what you are taking on and be super clear about that and probably reduce your priorities. Don't work on the nice to haves, but what is absolutely important because that's going to have a huge impact on work flow. Uh, And the third one is I talk about the power of three, to be honest, because I actually think that human beings can't cope with much more than three things. And also it is a real oxymoron because the word priority actually was singular. And it's only yes. in more recent times that we've actually created it as a plural. So, you know, you can have a priority, not necessarily several priorities. But, yeah, if we can try and get less is more, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And if there's a wonderful book, you might have read it, Deborah, called Essentialism. It's by I'm just Howard. reading it at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So I would, I would definitely recommend that. So we underestimate what we can do in uh, five years and we often overestimate what we can do in one. So that would be my third, uh, my second tip. And the third one was the one that I talked to you about is being purposeful about building connection. Have how are we going conversations and up your listening skills. I do this for a a living and even I find it really hard to actively listen at times. And so I think leaders can always get better at listening. And I suppose in this online environment, it's a little bit more difficult as well, right? Because I think when you're face-to-face with somebody, there's a lot more visual clues you can pick up on that's a little bit easier. Have you got any tips about how you can do that better online? Yeah, it's a tricky one. I think we're very Mm. fortunate in New Zealand in that we have this choice. And I think uh, certainly when you're having a meeting, I think look to the the purpose of the meeting. How important is that face-to-face, you know, connection? Uh, are there other mechanisms to do it? Certainly sometimes it's really important to be face-to-face if we can. Uh, But if we can't, I think just what we did before we got onto the uh, actual task at hand, which was our podcast, we connected and just got to know each other. Um, I I think that's probably the only thing I've got in that space. That's fantastic. Thank you. Hey, look, we're coming up to the end of the actual podcast now. So I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for for coming and joining me. I've really enjoyed, A, meeting you before the podcast and be having a chat about your book. Uh, where can people get hold of the book? Because I believe we had a few COVID issues around it getting stuck in port, but it's almost here now, isn't it? So where would they yeah, get hold of a copy of the book? <laughs> I feel sorry for my awesome publishers, Penguin Random House. Um, yes, there's uh, they got stuck on the port, uh, on the, uh, port but they're coming out, it's thanks COVID. Um, So you can buy the book in all good bookstores in New Zealand uh, from the 16th of February, which is next Tuesday. Uh, But you can pre-order by jumping onto my um, website. I have a burnout page. And if you want to be an early adopter, um, you can pre-order through there. Fantastic. So what is the address of your, where they can get that? So if you go to... If you go to susiemcalpine.com backslash, backslash burnout, uh, yep. or if you just go onto the main page and you look for the Beyond Burnout book, uh, you'll see it. And that tells you all about uh, the book, why Sir John Kerwin wrote the foreword, uh, yes. why he loved it so much, and, of course, how you can buy the book. Oh, fantastic. Well, look, just for the viewers again, this is actually the, the, the cover of the book. So look out for that nice beautiful um, yellow-orange colour. Susie, again, thank you so, so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, We'll make sure we've got links on our website and all of the information along with your tips. And um, I look forward to catching up again soon. Oh, Deborah, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks again for joining us on Better Business, Better Life with me, your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. If you enjoyed what you heard, then please subscribe to this podcast and let us help you to get what you want out of business and life. Each week, we will release a new 20-minute episode, which will give you three takeouts to put into action immediately on one of the six key areas that can take your business from good to great. These short podcasts are designed to be listened to in their entirety on the way to or from work or in your lunch break. The podcast is supported by free resources, templates, and useful tools, which you can find at deborahchantrytaylor.com. This podcast was proudly produced by NZ Audio Editors. For all your editing services, you can find us on the World Wide Web at www.nzaudioeditors.com.